having been a victim of child abuse or spouse abuse or sex abuse. I am just a woman who um, kind of fell in love with the idea of bringing liberation and freedom to families. Um, I haven't had any personal experience that would uh, inspire me to be on this journey. Community activist and advocate for those living with domestic violence, Nancy Creedman, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. For the last three decades, Nancy Creedman has committed her professional life to ending family violence in Hawaii. Domestic violence is often a hidden tragedy. Nancy has worked hard to bring public awareness to the issue and to establish innovative support programs. Along the way, she's seen terrible things that can never be erased from her mind's eye. And she's been part of many success stories as survivors find happier lives. She presses on with a relentlessly positive outlook and the belief that social change is within our reach. Nancy Creedman is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the nonprofit Domestic Violence Action Center in Honolulu. Born and educated on the East Coast of the United States, she grew up in a sports-minded household with her brother and parents in Englewood, New Jersey. I come from a two-parent working family. Uh, my mother was kind of an executive assistant to management in various places, Rockefeller Center, one. Uh, my father owned a shoe business in, in Manhattan. So we were kind of your average middle class, living in what I thought at the time was a diverse community. And your, were your parents role models for um, the way to behave in a domestic relationship? Not really, not really. Um, they did the best they could, but I don't think they um, had the personal resources really to uh, take themselves to intimacy or uh, close partnership. And I think that's because of the families they came from. But they did uh, a pretty good job. My brother and I turned out uh, pretty good. So uh, I think there were some things I could borrow. Uh, one thing that comes immediately to mind is um, my parents, when they would have a fight or get mad, um, they would, it would be silent. There would be the silent treatment for sometimes weeks which was very That's hard. A long time. Yeah, it was very hard. And um, when um, my daughter was a, a baby, small child, she would escalate into like a wild child rage. And then it would be over like that. And I remember saying to my husband, wow, isn't that incredible? Anger doesn't have to last so long. It's kind of like a fleeting, it can be a fleeting emotion. And that was life altering for me. When you uh, were ready uh, to, to leave the home or, or go off for schooling, where did you go? Well, I went first to Washington, D.C., which was uh, pretty exciting, but not the right fit for me. And then I went to Rutgers uh, in New Jersey, the State University. To study what? I studied uh, communication and journalism and psych psychology. Which I, I use a lot. You do. <laughs> you, and did you know that, that is, this is the way you were going to use those no, um, I had knowledge? Uh, no, I had no idea. I had no idea. I started out working a little bit in the cable television business, which was pretty popular in the 1970s when cable was first gaining momentum. And so I worked for the Public Utilities Commission uh, for a little while uh, regulating cable television. But I was working at a community action program, and so we did a lot of uh, production of television documentaries. I was a young woman and I thought I don't want to live here my whole life and if I don't leave now I'll probably I'll never leave I'll get stuck here so where can I go where I can do what I like to do the most. I'm a big outdoors person I swim I ride my bike I like to camp and hike and so I thought you know what? I'm gonna to go to Hawaii. So Had you been there before? No, I'd never been here before, no. It was um, pretty thrilling and um, a little scary biggest part was the thrill. I got on the plane with my bicycle and my camp trunk. I used to go to camp when I was a child. I checked into a hotel for a few days and I started looking for a place to live. And I rented a room in Manoa. And then I started working in Waikiki, which is where everybody starts working. So I was working at the International Marketplace. So I'd ride my bike from Manoa to Waikiki and back. Did you feel comfortable right away living I here? I felt um, 
It was a little confusing for me. I thought I grew up in a diverse community. It was sort of 50% Caucasian and 50% African American. And I thought that was a mixed community. And then I got here and I was like, wow. We're truly this mixed. Is really, <laughs> this is really diversity. So that was a little, I didn't know too much about um, Asian culture or I didn't, I don't think I knew anybody Asian, really. So that was pretty thrilling but a little unnerving because I didn't know how to fit in. But right away I liked that I was different and that it was different. I'm kind of a city person, so I love that on one side of the street was the ocean, because I'm a water person, and across the street is like Waikiki and buildings and hotels, and so it was sort of a combination of both. Since I came from Manhattan, I, I kind of liked both. While in New Jersey, Nancy Creedman helped create one of the nation's first shelters for battered women. In Hawaii, she continued to focus her energy on fostering public awareness to stop the emotional turmoil and deadly violence associated with domestic abuse. And so when I got here, I thought, hmm, I wonder what they're doing about domestic violence here, because I was just becoming uh, aware of the issue um, before I departed home. And of course, they weren't really doing anything here, like they weren't doing anything across the country. So I started working at the only existing shelter at the time. Where was that? That was in Kalihi. And so I worked the uh, weekend shift from Friday night to Sunday night. And really, um, two things happened for me. I mean, I wasn't m working at the shelter thinking, oh, this will be my career, this is great. I just was kind of living in the moment. This is good work, I feel good about it. This is important. But while I was there that first year, a couple of things um, happened uh, that were uh, life-altering uh, for me. One was um, they would send me out whenever they got invitations to speak about domestic violence because I was the one with the communications degree and they figured I could talk. So I would go and I would bring the uh, only existing film that the shelter owned. And it was a mainland produced film and uh, it had all white people and maybe one Spanish person and one black person in the film. And I could see that the community I was with looked at the film thinking, I don't know anybody like that. And I started thinking to myself, well, if we're gonna talk about this issue, we're gonna have to talk about it in a way that makes sense for this community. So I teamed up with a director and we wrote a small grant to produce a locally originated uh, documentary. Call, we called it Too Many Lickens, Spouse Abuse in Hawaii. And it was aired on public television and we circulated it a lot and it began the conversation here. But the other thing that happened was Sunday morning, the women would uh, get up um, very enthusiastic about a search for a new place to live for them and their kids. So they'd everybody be out with the newspaper and they'd get on the bus and you know circle things in the paper of places that they were going to go look at to see about um, relocating to get away from the abuse uh, by their partner. And then by Sunday afternoon they'd come back and they'd be they start packing up their um, suitcases or their bags and say they were going home. Home to the abuser. Home to the abuser, yeah. And um, that made me very nervous because I fully understood that there was nothing that could have changed between the time she left and when she was going back. But the barriers to her um, finding a new place to live without any money or without any transportation or too far from her kids' schools or whatever it was, was a big enough obstacle that she had to go home. So I teamed up with a social worker friend of mine and we wrote a different small grant and started a program for batterers called Como Mai. Before that, there, there, was, there were programs for women, but not for there weren't male any, abusers. There weren't any programs, really. There was just this one shelter. We hadn't yet um, gotten to the place at the community level where there were community-based programs or specialized uh, support groups or anything like that yet. And so this was um, the first specialized program, and we really just made it up. Were they court-ordered abusers, or were there batterers who said, hey, I'd like some help, I'm, I'm seeking this help? Um, they were not seeking the help. We tried to uh, reach out to um, community clinics and mental health programs and social service agencies, and also the courts. 
and uh, tried to advocate for the courts to mandate um, participation, which they, uh, which they did. Uh, they could see the wisdom of that and they could see the importance of requiring somebody to participate. Um, but it was slow going. Um, we didn't really have the capacity to help lots and lots of people anyway. It was kind of an experiment. And, um, but it, was, it planted the seeds here in Hawaii anyway. And of course, we didn't realize this at the time, but this is what was going on all across the country. Um, so our challenge was really to get them to shift their behavior and to shift their thinking that they had the right to um, uh, hit somebody out of uh, desire to make them do what they wanted them to do. You know, I, I read years ago that this type of counseling and it just isn't that effective, that it, it, yeah. it doesn't permanently change behavior. Well, the, um, the data on effectiveness is uh, very mixed. It um, takes a lot to change behavior. Anybody who's ever tried to go on a diet or exercise quit smoking, more, quit sure. smoking, stop biting their nails, whatever their thing is, it takes a lot of personal discipline, it takes a lot of commitment, and it takes a lot of reinforcement to stay on the path. And so without that, it's very easy to kind of keep acting like, well, it's her fault if she didn't this or she didn't that, or if I had it better off or if I didn't, you know. So there's a lot of ways to um, minimize or um, excuse the behavior. We still have so many barriers in the path for uh, survivors anyway, um, to get to the place where they're self-sufficient and um, until we as a community understand that everybody has the right to live free and safe and we make that path wide open and we invite people to live that way, um, they won't be able to. They will be forced to go back and they will uh, face their own um, community sanctions and their own religious sanctions and their own personal and emotional ambivalence about what they've done, what they're doing. Um, and if we continue to perpetuate the ideas that children are better off with two parents and it's your fault or somehow you've done something to provoke this, then it's going to be difficult. And I mean, I want to say, I'd like to be here today to say that that mythology has vanished, but it really hasn't, that people are still, despite what we've done here, and there's a lot to be proud of for all of us who've been working in the community, media, policy makers, service providers, we've made a lot of progress. But I continue to be amazed that people hold on to the same myths and misconceptions about who's done what to whom and who deserves it and why it happens and it only happens to brown people in Palolo or people who use drugs or, I mean, we're still dispelling those misconceptions and we just have to keep encouraging people and inviting people to get involved because it is everybody's business what's happening in your workplace or your neighborhood or your family uh, belongs to all of us. Nancy Creedman credits her friends and family with providing opportunities for her own personal growth. She met her husband, Bernie Paloma, a firefighter at a downtown block party celebration. He invited her to visit his fire station in Manoa Valley, which just happened to be located along Nancy's daily bike route to work. A couple of weeks later, she stopped by and was invited to stay for dinner at the station. The rest is history, and as of the day of our conversation in 2011, the couple has been together for 28 years. My husband is very, very different than I am. Uh, he's a, a local male, um, quiet. We've sort of got the balance going of introversion and extroversion. And what, what does local mean? Well, he's a Filipino from a large uh, Filipino family. Grew up in Kalihi, nine children. Um, and. Um, so I have been able to understand uh, local culture and Filipino communities and Kalihi and big families in a way that was really um, a precious opportunity for me because I could take that with me out into the community. Um, because in order to communicate with him, it was like practice of how to communicate with uh, the wider community and with his family. Um, I mean, his parents, you know, they loved me and welcomed me uh, immediately. Soon it was Nancy Creedman and Bernie Paloma, plus two. They had a daughter and a son. One day, Nancy learned that State Child Protective Services was seeking a permanent home for an 11-year-old girl. Her children were reaching adolescence, and she thought, what's one more? 
So I went home and um, mentioned it to Bernie, and uh, he was open to the idea. And I thought, well, gosh, what do you do? What do you do then? You know. And so I asked the um, attorney who was the guardian ad litem uh, whether we could meet her, which is unheard of. I mean, you don't usually do that. You just get a foster kid, and that's kind of the beginning of um, the relationship or the first the moment the person joins the family. But to me, that just seemed, well, how do, you, how do you do that? You have to at least meet this person. So Bernie and I had lunch with her. She seemed perfectly fantastic. And so we talked it over with the kids that, you know, we had met this girl and we were thinking about having her join our family and how did they feel about it. And um, they were interested in the idea, but of course it was difficult to absorb. And then the four of us uh, had dinner, Sunday dinner together, and uh, sorted it out among ourselves, like how did we feel about it? And it was thumbs up all the all around. So she uh, joined our family when she was 11 and she's um, in between my biological children. It's, again, it's uh, been a treasure having her in our lives and it's a challenge. I mean, you don't just join somebody else's family. I mean, one day she doesn't know us at all and we don't know her. And then the next day she's a member of the family. So we had to like rework all of our, how did we relate to each other? How did we make room for her to join the family? What were the relationships between them? I mean, it was, um, obviously it was a life altering um, opportunity and a way for us to do more of what we were already doing, the ways in which we were you know, giving to the community. My husband was a fire captain, so he was a man of service as, as well as I. Um, so we brought that service um, into our family. And how does your family feel about your role in um, working against domestic violence? Do they, do, do they comment on it? Are they with you on it? Are they, do they get sick of hearing about it? Well, um, I mean, it's very much a part of our lives, obviously. Um, it depends on many things. I mean, there's many moving parts. Um, I'm always pointing things out. I'm always uh, noting things that are going on. Um, I have invited them uh, to participate in many, many ways. Everybody in the family, nieces, nephews, children, have been in posters and flyers and materials. Um, they are uh, with me 100%, 100%, and that's what's made it possible. There's no way I could have given myself over to this journey without them being there with me. You know, over time, you've become close. You've you've, you've seen um, in many different lights uh, some of the the people who've suffered abuse, yeah. and have, have been again and again in those situations. Um, do you go home hoping nothing happens to them that night? I mean, is it something that you take with you? Is it an anxiety-producing thing to know that they're constantly in danger or possible danger? I've had to figure out along the way um, how to um, tap into my compassion and my service uh, without um, being consumed by my anxiety about people's well-being. That must be a very tough call for you. I mean, it's a, it's a boundary that's very opaque. It's, um, it was much harder before than it is now. I mean, now I um, don't work with people as directly as I used to. I mean, I have run um, hundreds and hundreds of batterers program uh, groups and hundreds and hundreds of victim support groups, and that was that was harder. Um, but I had that's when I really had to teach myself. Otherwise, I would have been a wreck, and I wouldn't have been uh, useful or effective or um, you know uh, grounded at all. And I know people always ask me that, well, how do, you do, how do you do this? And I don't know that I've got a formula exactly or even a way for you to do it. But you've been able to last so long and, and be so yeah. strong because somehow you can tilt your world. Well, I try to take you know, very good care of myself. Um, I um, swim every day. I uh, go out into the jungle, you know, in Manoa or Makiki or you know, Mariner's Ridge or someplace where it's sort of quiet and bigger than I am and vast, you know, the sky is vast or the ocean is vast. And it helps me to put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, I rest well, I eat well, I surround myself with loving family and friends. I mean, I, mean, I really try to uh, uh, stay whole myself. I, I know this all sounds sort of corny, but that's kind of how I do it. Because otherwise it would just eat, eat It up. would eat me alive. Because there are some yeah. stories that are just, I mean, it's, it's hard to even re recite the details because they're so no. horrific. Well, the ones that um, probably have been the most uh, torment for me are the um, women who I've gotten close to who are mothers who have lost their children to domestic violence. And the ragged grief they feel and the helplessness and the hopelessness that they feel that I do have a little bit of difficulty um, uh, walking away from their suffering. And that kind of loss is something that you really, really cannot understand if it hasn't happened to you. Um, and so to try to be present with somebody who is in that kind of suffering was um, also kind of art. It's a very delicate subject and most people are very, very uncomfortable with it. So I have had to um, learn a kind of grace so that people will listen to me. And of course, when I first got here, I, you know, and when I was first doing this work, I mean, it doesn't come naturally, really, to figure out, I mean, I'm thinking, well, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just saying what I know and what I see. And people should be willing and amenable to listening to that. But of course, people all have their own capacity to hear the truth. So I had to learn how, how to do that. You have, you've been so outspoken on this subject. Has, has it uh, put you at risk? We take our safety very seriously at the agency that I work, the Domestic Violence Action Center. Sometimes I'll be someplace and somebody will come up to me and say, you're Nancy Creedman, aren't you? And I will stop for a moment and think, oh, I wonder if that's a good thing. Um, and usually, and so far it has been. People have said, oh, I was in your class when you taught at Leeward, or I was in your batter women's group in 1982, or thank you so much, or I was in your batterers group, you probably don't remember me, and it changed my life. But if you're so needed, why doesn't the community support you more? Well, there's a lot of competing needs, and this doesn't resonate for everybody. I would like to live in a world where they would say this is, this is number one because families are at the root of communities. And if our families are um, not well and not stable and not whole, our communities won't be. But that's a hard message for everybody to digest. So my fantasy would be that people are throwing money at us to do this because the work is so hard. I mean, we are wiping up the blood, sweat, and tears of the community and that's hard enough, but then having to beg for money to do it, some days it's, it's heartbreaking. You know, some kids or some young adults decide, this is what I want to do with my life. I never had that picture. So maybe the absence of that uh, created the room for me to be uh, the instrument I have been. You just followed the, the path and the doors and looked for opportunities. I just recognized opportunities when they presented themselves. It's not quite so much I looked for opportunities. I mean, here's an example. I was in way back when I was, like I mentioned earlier, running a batterers groups at the Waikiki Community Center. Um, I did the paperwork and set up all the appointments from my home, and then I would go to the uh, center to run the groups. And one day after, you know, months, Jerry Lee, who was the director of the Waikiki Community Center at the time, came to me and she said, you know what, it looks like this is a fantastic program and that it would really benefit from having a program, a home, uh, an agency, an organization to support it. Why don't you consider bringing Komo Mai and Maluhia Wahine to the Waikiki Community Center and they can become programs of the Waikiki Community Center? And that was perfect. I mean, how could I possibly have continued to do what I was doing all by myself. I needed an institution, I needed an organization. And so it was kind of like that uh, all along the way. 
Some nonprofit leaders move from one agency, one worthy cause, to another. Nancy Creedman's cause has always been ending domestic violence. In 2010, the YWCA of Oahu honored Nancy Creedman as a community leader deserving special recognition. Nancy believes that her work is innately rewarding, giving her a spiritual benefit that's transformative and life enriching. In 2011, the year of this conversation, she continues to engage and collaborate to create social change and provide critical services through the Domestic Violence Action Center. Mahalo piha, Nancy Creedman, for sharing your long story short. And thank you for watching and supporting PBS Hawaii. I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho kako. For audio and written transcripts of this program and all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. As abusers, uh, perpetrators, they've got a lot to hide and um, they've... Um, they've learned how. They've learned how and they're very charming. They can be very persuasive. And so, I mean, sometimes I'll go into a place and I'll think, well, that's not a good guy. And then other times, somebody I'd never pick out would be somebody who, and that, believe me, that has happened thousands of times. I don't go any place anymore where somebody doesn't come up to me and say, my first husband, my mother, my auntie, my next door neighbor, my daughter, my coworker. I mean, no place. I go almost no place now where somebody doesn't feel like they want to share that with me, which is a remarkable thing.